Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, we'll go ahead and install this. Oops, I missed a little wax here. Well, that looks nice. Okay, so it goes on the outside of the flange on the ends. So, first I get one side started. And then, if I remember right, I had to be persuaded just a bit to come on over to the other side. There we go. Very nice. Beautiful. Okay. This has some very small screws, two on each side, with some star washers and some flat washers. Install these with my magic screwdriver. Open the drawer so that it catches in any that fall instead of the floor monster. So remember this plate has slots in every, every screw hole is, is slotted or is a slot. And what that does is make it pretty adjustable. So if I don't tighten everything real tight right now, and I wait till I mount this in the cabinet, then I can tighten it, or just tighten it enough so that it's hand adjustable, and uh, leave it at that once I get it in place, as long as it's tight enough to hold it wherever I leave it. The idea being that I don't want it to look crooked in the cabinet once it's installed. Okay, I will leave it like that for the moment, and, uh, and that way I can make adjustments when I assemble the set. So, I'm getting a lot of empty baggies, guys. That's a good sign. Okay, there's another one. Empty in the baggies. I love it when the project starts emptying baggies rather than filling them. Take a peek at some knobs and see what our situation is there because I can go ahead and install these knobs now and not worry about having to remove them because the way this chassis mounts in the radio the knobs don't have to come off for me to install this in the cabinet because this all installs it slides into a big opening in the front of the cabinet so that makes it nice I can go ahead and clean the knobs up and mount them and be done with it so let's look at what they look like we didn't really look at them when we uh, started this. So I don't know about putting, I might try it on one of them, a little bit of red lacquer in each of those little spots. Because that, that's, you know, this is a, this customer is one of those people I call a practical customer. This is, I'm doing this radio for a furniture re restoration business who has a customer that had this radio wants wants it as a functional radio of course but as a nice piece of furniture too this is a practical person this is a person they want me to set this up for bluetooth so they want to use this thing which means they're going to want the knobs to look to be more usable than perfectly original so i'll do what i can to respect the originality but i'll probably touch those red dots up of course a little bit of polish won't hurt these either Okay, and uh, that's right, the tuning knob I've got put away somewhere, I'm going to have to do something with that. I'll probably wind up painting that, as much as I hate to do it, because I know it's front and center, but the way it looks now, all corroded, it just isn't going to work. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get those knobs ready and start doing some polishing. Often that is, that is enough. Doesn't take much, a little dab, a little dollop on the on the, the towel. Takes a bit of, of work. But this isn't gonna kill me. Work doesn't kill anybody. Mm, I can smell it. I'm beginning to think these are bakelite, because that smells like bakelite, and that color that's coming off looks like bakelite. Well, bakelite is wonderful, except that it's a little tough to polish at times. You can make it clean, but sometimes you can't bring the surface back to what it once was with polishing. I've tried everything, wet sanding, polishing. I can get it pretty nice and smooth and uniform, but it's real hard to get it to shine like when it was new. 
sometimes you're better off to just leave it be if you got that situation going on. But these knobs, I like that they're not uh, they're not dirt, dirt trapping knobs, so I'll be able to get these looking real clean anyway. You know, a lot of knobs with the the, uh, the real fine knurling or whatever you want to call it on, on around the circumference. Well, that collects dirt, and you you can scrub sometimes three or four times after soaking those. You can scrub it with a toothbrush and still not get it all out. Yeah, that's Bakelite. I know that smell. So let's see how successful we are at getting these Bakelite knobs to look good. A lot of times with this compound, the better thing, to, the best thing to do, like many compounds, is buff until it begins to dry. When you start to see shiny spots because it's drying, well then you know you're you're about done with the buffing. See, there we go. There come the shiny spots. You see them? Oh yeah, it's gonna be a nice looking knob. Mm-hmm. Let's get a soft cloth now. Clean it up. Bakelite is one of my very favorite materials, and, and I'm sad that it's not being used really anymore. I'm sure there are certain special applications where Bakelite is used. Well, perhaps not, but, you know, it was, a, it was an early thermoplastic. More, it, it behaves more like a resin, I think, than a, than a plastic, a, a classical plastic that we think of now. I don't think putting wax on this will do it much good. It's not going to corrode. And I don't know if it would shine it up or not. There is one way to find out, however. I can try it on one. So before I do that, let me show you. So there's the cleaned up one, and there's the original. There's one the way they came to me. Not too bad, not too bad, and part of it, you see there's a little chip in this Bakelite here, that should have tipped me off. Yeah, too bad. So, okay, so, and their metal core, and that's kind of strange, I mean it makes sense, it works, that's why they're so heavy. We get, I thought they were painted metal, I didn't look closely enough at them when I took them apart. But, uh... Let's see what happens with a little bit of wax. See if it, it really uh, makes a difference on these. If it does, I'll wax all of them. Maybe on this one, I'll wait on the wax. Because I'm going to paint that little little uh, indicator spot. So let me clean that wax out of there. The thing about Bakelite that makes it kind of cool is that Bakelite is not really affected by lacquer thinner. So I can clean the living snot out of this Bakelite with this lacquer thinner and it'll still shine like it did before. That's one of the differences between this and modern plastics. So the reason I'm doing that is because I want to take a little dot of red paint and see how filling that in goes. So I'll wax the next one. I'll show you what that looks like when I get there. Okay, hey, just put a little bit of wax on here. Doesn't take much. We're going to remove 99.8% of it anyway. You just want to make sure that all the surfaces are evenly and thinly coated. Now this can be counterproductive if you're working on a piece where the surfaces um, can be filled with wax, but you can't get to them to get it, the wax out. Then, you, then you, all you see is the dried wax in there. That doesn't look good either, so you want to be aware of that, just like when you wax your car. Well, I don't know how many people still wax their cars. Um, I like to, but you know, I think it's a, something that has gone by the wayside. Not because cars are better, but because people just don't want to do it anymore. I'd rather buy a new car. Then wax the one they have. I can feel myself getting grumpy. Time for a little refreshment. Mm. 
Okay, how about we do this um, escutcheon for the tuning knob? And then I'll do the rest of them off camera. But I want to see how this one, I want you to see how this one turns out. I'll go ahead and remove these screws and nuts. Only because they're going to get crap under them anyway. Now a lot of times, after I have polished it, or after I've, yeah, polished it with the polishing compound, if there are some places where the polishing compound has gotten, well then I'll take it into the bathroom. Don't tell wifey. I'll take it in the bathroom and I'll grab a toothbrush. Um, no, not my toothbrush. I'll, I'll usually grab hers. And uh, I'll clean the part with the toothbrush and some soapy water and that gets the polishing compound out. Okay, so here I go. Gonna polish this. This, is, this I knew was Bakelite. Now here's the thing about this. With polishing compound, you don't want to put a lot of downward pressure on it. You're not trying to sand the material off. All you're trying to do is polish it. So that means most of your work should be back and forth and not pushing down. If you're wearing your, your fingers or your thumb out by pushing down, you're doing it the wrong way. Round and around is what you need to do. And you do that until the, the, the polishing compound is almost all gone from drying and then you wipe off what remains and that will put a, a nice polish on it that will stay a long time if you take care of it. See Bakelite is kind of a funny surface to polish. It looks fantastic well polished but it never quite gets glass shiny and I've had lots of Bakelite radios and TVs that I've done and they're all like that. If they start out glass shiny well then you can polish them back to it but that Bakelite I don't know if it oxidized or what it got it gets like a grainy surface perhaps that was on the less expensive model expensive models that's how it was to begin with I don't know but once you got that grainy surface you never get rid of it and the thing about Bakelite too is that it has like a surface glaze to it that's part of the makeup of the material when it's first being been molded if you break through that surface glaze while you're polishing that's it you're done so you have to be if you're gonna wet sand which I've tried you have to be very very careful not to break through that and it can be really thin you break through that and it'll never shine again not in, in any capacity at all and it doesn't matter what you do unless I have thought about this but I haven't tried it unless you spray it with some clear lacquer. I've thought about doing that on some really far gone sets and I probably will try it someday on a couple of tabletop radios that I have that are Bakelite that are just shot. I mean literally they're, they look dull and they'll never shine again. So I thought about shine, you know, spraying them lightly with some clear lacquer and then I can wet sand that clear lacquer and polish that. Buff it up with a soft cloth Yikes, you want to try to minimize that. That's why I work on a wood bench, for, and for other reasons too, but one of the advantages of a wood bench is you can occasionally drop something without really ruining it. I have considered a cork board bench with replaceable cork board, and I still might do that. I don't know yet. I just have to see what would be involved. I have a, a large supply of, I have a gigantic roll of cork board that I've had for a while and it'll last the rest of my life if I just use it for gaskets. I'm thinking about using it for a bench top material. I don't know. It might work, might not. Okay, there's that guy. It looks really good. I don't know how the wax is going to do it. I'm not really willing to put wax on this until I know. So I'm going to go ahead and polish up the rest of these knobs off camera and then I'll come back and we'll buff off the wax from this guy here and we'll see how that works. Okay, I'm going to try and put a dollop of red paint in the arrow on this, uh, this knob and let's see how it works. Now, what am I going to use? I'm just going to use some testers model paint. It's enamel, so you don't have to polish it to shine it. It's pretty durable stuff. It does take forever to dry, but it adheres to the plastic really well. And I won't have to worry about... Uh, polishing it to make it look good when I'm all done. And if I put it on nice and thin, then it might look, it'll look old, it'll look worn because some of the dark 
from the Bakelite will show through, and that's what I want. So let's see here. First time I've done this, guys, so uh, have patience with me. I'm just using a very small screwdriver. I'm not aiming for perfection because perfection is more obvious than things with small imperfections that help it to blend into the background. Okay, there you go. Now, my only fear is that it will look too different from the original. But I think it will be okay. On this original, I will probably, on all of the originals that have some missing, I might touch it up. I might touch all of them up. I just don't know yet until I get an idea. But I know they were supposed to be red, and I know the owner is going to like that. When they see that, they're looking for a little bit of bling on this radio, and so I'm trying to provide it. Now, if you look at that closely, you'll see that's not perfect. But, but the idea is to make that look good. Okay, here we go. Here are the two different knobs. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but the knob on the right is waxed, and the knob on the left is not waxed. And I'll be darned, there is a little bit better shine from the wax side. So I'm going to wind up waxing all these knobs. It also gives it a better feel. It makes it feel a little bit smoother, silkier. So um, first things first, I am going to paint all these dots, these arrows. It's going to touch them up. Let those dry so it's going to take a long time and then I'll wax these. So after that paint is dry, I'll wax these. So, okay, that's the plan with these knobs. They won't be going on this weekend. Here are the knobs with the little arrows pointed on them, painted on them. Like I say, they're not perfect, but they don't look too bad. And, uh, once these have dried, and I mean dried for a couple days, this uh, one thing about this model paint is it doesn't dry quickly. So when it's dried for a couple days, then I'll put a little wax on this, on each of these, and I'll be good to go. I am going to wax this escutcheon right away and, uh, and buff it up nicely so I can go ahead and mount it on the radio, the front face. It mounts on there like that. And then that tuning knob, the big chrome tuning knob mounts in front of it. Alright, I got the buttons installed on the radio. Or the push buttons. Clean those up, polish those up. They're looking real good. So that's, that's working. These are nice and smooth. I'm pretty sure that's going to be fine. Got, of course, got this plate on. I have uh, uh, painted the little indicator marks on each of the knobs. I didn't want to just do the ones that didn't that where the paint was gone because then they look different than the ones that still had paint on them. So I opted to go ahead and do all of them because I think that looks much better. They actually look pretty good. Knobs are smooth. They're um, I waxed those as well, so they're all, they're ready to go. And um, I think uh, I think I'm done with all of that stuff. I have a quandary though, and that is this guy right here. All right, so the knob on this is supposed to be chrome, and originally it was a bright, shiny, big, beautiful knob, right smack in your face, and uh, just plated in nice chrome. Very nice, but the problem is, is that this is what I have right now. This knob is not so nice. It's pretty corroded. Now, I am going to try to polish this up. I'll use a, a uh, nylon toothbrush and some semichrome. If that doesn't work, and I'll use that same nylon toothbrush and do it with some navel jelly and see if I can't get this to shine. If I go using steel wool or a, uh, a wire brush on this, I'm going to scratch it up and there's no point then in getting it to shine. If the uh, navel jelly or the semichrome does not work, well then all, all I have left to do then is to paint it. And I'll paint it with that same uh, steal it paint that I used over here and it'll still look okay it'll still look okay but it won't look you know the nice shiny but see that'll look terrible that way so I'll go ahead and get that going well I decided not to mess around with the semichrome first because I'll have the same experience I had with the rest of the radio 
I'll use the Simichrome after I've used the Navel Jelly. But the Navel Jelly, I'm just going to go right to that because I don't think anything else is going to clean this corrosion up. So let me get started on that. It's really simple. Don't be shy about using the stuff. It's cheap. Get it on there, spread it around. The idea is to keep this stuff wet once you get it on there and and uh, keep moving it around so it beats up on that corrosion. Now I'm pretty sure this thing is brass underneath this plating because I don't see any rust but what I see a lot of is green um, green oxidation so that kind of portends of this thing being made of brass. I don't know that for sure. So then you get it on there and you just start working it. This stuff smells strong. After a while you start liking these smells because you know you only smell them when you're doing stuff you enjoy so it becomes something that's pleasant to you. And you can kind of see it's eating that corrosion away but it isn't fast and you have to do this a couple of different times. Get the sides, they'll have to be scrubbed too. You want to be kind of careful of where the little splatters go as you're working. So, you know, aim the toothbrush or into a, you know, some place where it's not going to cause a lot of harm. In fact, the best thing for me to do, just so I don't start, just so you don't see me cussing later, is to go ahead and cover that radio up. That way, no splatters at all will get to that bugger. I asked a question on the antique radio forum this morning, and you know, I don't know what your guys' experience has been. Um, I'm not a radio genius. I'm just a hobbyist who's learning. And I don't have a whole lifetime of working in radio or communications or tube gear or anything like that to back me up. So when I ask a question, it's usually because I don't know the answer. And I don't know if it's just me, but every time I ask a question on an antique radio forum, the vast majority of the responses I get are smart alecky guys who, who act as if I'm a dummy for not already knowing the answer. They'll give, you know, quick little, little uh, quips for, for responses, usually aimed at, uh, well, well, didn't you know this? Or, you know, and then the, the suggestions I do get often are the really easy ones I've already tried. You know that anybody would try and I, you know I got to thinking about all of that and I this antique radio forum thing I hear I hear guys talk about it. I hear Buzz talk about it I hear Bob Anderson talk about it I hear other people talking about it but the truth is for me when I go on there they're not all that useful for me they're, they don't help me out much and you know I tried to help somebody one time by answering questions because he was working on a radio similar to the one I was working on. And another guy who was out there trolling, looking for people to jump on apparently, jumped on me because he didn't like my answer and thought that I was totally out to lunch. Well, that's, you know, maybe I was or maybe I wasn't. But this, this thing, it's like Antique Radio Forum is becoming the Facebook of the radio hobby. Well, hell, I don't need another Facebook. If I want to get smart-ass answers from people, I can go to Facebook and get plenty of that. There's a lot of unintelligent people on Facebook who think they know everything, who, and I can get all the answers I need from those folks. I really don't need to get it from the Antique Radio Forum. But, you know, that's just my opinion. So, you know, sadly, here's a good idea. You know, a forum like that is a good idea, but it's populated by people who, who think, you know, that they know everything and... They want to make sure that you think they know everything. And as a result, it makes it an unpleasant place for newbies to go. Now, if I feel lousy, and I've been working on radios for a couple of years, if I feel lousy when I go on there, I don't have a good experience, I can only imagine what a true newbie feels like when they discover antique radio form and start looking around at what you know people are talking about, what, they're, what questions are being asked and what, how they're being answered. That's all right, man. I guess, you know... I learned the hobby pretty much on my own. I never heard of Antique Radio Forum until after I was in it for a while. 
and I'll just continue on my own and I'll make mistakes. I'm not as smart as some of those guys in terms of my radio experience and knowledge, but you know, that's all right. I, I have an open mind and I'll learn the best way I can. But one thing I don't have to do is put up with smart alecky old farts who think that just because I'm a young guy who's just beginning that I don't deserve to be treated, you know, with any kind of respect. Oh well, that's my two cents on Antique Radio Forum. You know, chime in in the comments and let me know if your experience has been different. Or if your experience has been the same and, and I'm really not crazy. If I polish that up and put a little wax on it, it might just be fine. Hey, this is actually not turning out too bad. Guys, if I just work this a bit more, this might be okay. But what we're starting with is certainly going to be a lot better than where this thing started. I swear this radio sat out in a barn somewhere and rusted and rusted before I ever saw it. And um, a few more years of that and this radio wouldn't have been savable at all. I'm convinced of it. Which would be very unfortunate because this 800B is definitely a radio worth saving. You know, there's a lot of uh, Scott purists who will tell you that the only radio is worth anything. The only Scott's worth a darn thing are the ones that were made before the war. That's fine. You know, that's like saying the only Packards that are worth anything are the ones made before the war. But uh, you, you go ahead and climb inside of a 1947 Packard Clipper and you tell me if that's not a, a worthy car. Well, it's the same thing with these radios. It may not be the same, maybe not as rare or as unique to look at as the Scots made pre-war. It may not even be made by the, exactly the same people, but the truth is it's still a worthy radio. And... Um, I don't know. There's, it's funny. I'm on a rant today, guys. Sorry. There's a lot of radio snobs out there, and those radio snobs are trolling the internet, and they all got opinions about what radio is worth something, and what's what radio is not worth something. In my opinion, a radio is worth what it's worth to you, and if that radio means something to you, then you could put all the money you want into it, and it's still a worthwhile investment because that radio makes you happy. And so I've stopped a long time ago listening to the morons who want to tell me how much a radio is worth according to this book or that book or, you know, you shouldn't spend any money on this radio because, you know, they're not worth that much. Who cares? Who really gives a crap, man? If you'd like a radio and it's worth it to you, that's fine. My wife and kids gave me a GE uh, J805 for Christmas years ago. It's not an uncommon radio. It's a nice, you know, average, your average shortwave, AM, AM shortwave GE radio, standard console, made in 1940. And, and you know, so there's nothing terribly uh, special in terms of rarity on that radio. But you know what? I put a lot of work into that radio, and I put a lot of money into good parts for it. I did a super nice job on the cabinet. Because that radio, to me, was worth something. It came from my family, and they gave it to me as a special Christmas gift, and so I treated it with the respect that it deserves. And to have someone then tell me later, oh, the GE J805 is really not worth that much. They're common. Well, you know what? The one that I own, the one that was given to me is not common. There were one of those, and that's the one that was given to me. So, all right. I'll try to be more cheerful now. Um... It's funny, earlier today, I, I was watching a Buzz video, and he was playing a song called The Bad Humor Guy. Well, that song pretty, pretty much describes me today. Uh, those guys on Antique Radio Forum kind of pissed me off, and I haven't quite gotten over it yet. But that's all right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Antique Radio Forum anymore, and I certainly won't recommend other people to do it either. I will uh, I'll put the belly button jelly away for now, and I'll go ahead and rinse this off under some plenty of water, and I'll get to work with the Simichrome on it. Wow, considering this was all green and rough, and when I first got it, I even cleaned it up some from that, and then uh, to get it to where you first saw it, and uh, this is really going to make it nice. This is, this has been cleaned. And the last step is a coat of wax. Let it sit for a while. And uh, go ahead and install it on the radio. Like I've mentioned before, I like to use kind of dried out wax. 
And the reason for that is, is the really wet new wax goes everywhere. It goes in every little crevice, and then it's hard to get it out of those crevices when it, when it begins to dry. This dried out wax is more controllable. And uh, since I'm not talking about cars that are going to be out on salty roads, uh, it's more important that I just get a general coat on there to make it shine and help corrosion, but with an indoor environment, than to get tons of wax on it and uh, have it go absolutely everywhere. And it's a good way for me to dispose of the wax from last year that I didn't finish. So, Okay, the front is pretty well finished. Let me get in here and show you the knobs. There you go, the knobs with uh, that center chrome knob polished up as well as I'm going to get it polished. And actually, I think it pr looks pretty good. So, looks pretty nice actually. And uh, we'll take a look around this thing. Pretty well done, ready to go. So it looks looks good, I think. We're not talking perfection here, but we are talking something that looks decent. This is a lot nicer than it, the way it came to me. And I think the owner is going to be quite pleased with it. Push buttons look real good. I'm going to make labels for those. That will be another thing I do late in the game. Right now my goal is to get everything working. I will be set, setting those, those uh, preset adjustments to some stations once I get the little tags made. Is that capacitor, that electrolytic, that basically that's just for dress now. And there are those three tubes that are part of the uh, the FM tuning, the FM uh, the FMRF section, the long cables that connect the amplifier to the receiver. Here you see the back sides of the push buttons and the back side of the tuning gear. So basically this thing is pretty much ready to rock and roll. Now I haven't troubleshot this because I'm going to need the speaker to do that. Actually I don't because the speaker is a permanent magnet speaker. And as long as I put some resistors on it like what's on there now, what's supposed to be on there now, um, it would work fine. But I might as well just do the speaker and get it done. Okay, I'm going to set this thing aside now. Okay, it's been one hell of a long fight to get to this point, and you've had to put up a little bit of grumpiness on my part. Sorry about that, guys. But uh, I'm to the point now where I am working on the record player and working on the speaker. Actually, I have the speaker nearly done, and I will be showing that to you very soon in episode number 11. But uh, I will keep working on those things, and uh, by this coming weekend, I should be able to troubleshoot this, the, begin troubleshooting this radio. So, from your Western Outpost in Salt Lake City, that's uh, part number 10, and that's all for tonight.